Instagram. We are waiting on Facebook. There we go. All right. Good morning, guys. Welcome to the PT on Ice Daily Show brought to you by the Institute of Clinical Excellence. My name is Julie Brower and I am a TA for the Older Adult Division and that is alongside our lead faculty, Dustin Jones and Christina Prevett. So it's Wednesday which means it's Jerry on Ice Day. So a couple quick announcements about um, where we're gonna be um, on the road and then our online course as well. So for online, um, Modern Management of the Older Adult Essential Foundations, that begins on October 13th. So if you're thinking about it, go ahead and make sure to snag a spot because we have been selling out far before our start date over the past several cohorts. On the road, we will be in Everett, Washington on October 2nd. On the 9th of October, we'll be in Bozeman, Montana. And then November 6th, we're going to be in Massillon, Ohio. And next weekend, Dustin and I will be in Casper, Wyoming. And we are speaking to a group of OTs. Yes, we will be speaking to an entire group of OTs. And this is what um, sparked the inspiration for today's episode. So I don't know if all of you know, we announced it probably maybe around March of this year, but our course has been approved for CEUs by the AOTA, which is amazing because, you know, at, at the end of the day, we want PT, OT, and patient kind of like arms banded together, walking forward into the land of fitness, pretty much, right? So we want to bring this fitness forward approach, not just to PTs, but we want and need OTs to come along with us. Because at the end of the day, if we are going to maximize our patients' functional recovery and get them back to doing exactly what they want to do in life, then PT and OT need to be on the same page, and we need to be collaborating um, effectively and efficiently. So when we talk about the relationship of, of PT and OT, um, you know, from being in the hospital for almost six years, and, and now I've transitioned into home health, I've seen this relationship go beautifully, right? I, I Especially like in our ICUs, our trauma floors, um, these beautiful co-treatments and co-evals and, and advocating for patients together and sharing knowledge. I've seen it go beautifully and I've seen it go really wrong. Um, a lot of turf wars and I've seen relationships between colleagues and friends be really damaged because each profession is, is very territorial. Um, and, you know, but I, I really wanted to dig deeper beyond my own experience and my own um, perspective. So I wanted to reach out to an OT to really get the perspective of, the, of an OT and an OT, the OT profession in general. So I reached out to my dear friend and dear colleague. Her name is Madison Reap. I worked with her for several years before she moved out of Charlotte. Um, she is a fitness forward OT. She's an avid CrossFitter. She's CrossFit Level 1 certified. Um, she has her MS in health promotion. She's an NCOTA board member. She was the only OT on the COVID team at her hospital um, for, for a good portion of last year. She's the lead critical care OT, um, and she is at High Point Medical Center. Um, in Winston-Salem, which is an affiliate of Wake Forest Baptist Health. So I reached out to her and I wish she could be here with me so we could kind of do this interview style, but we had this really amazing discussion. 
And I, I wanted to just get her ideas of, you know, what are the pain points between PT and OT? What is she seeing? And how do we break these silos? How do we work together more effectively? Um, how do we structure a treatment session so that we are both serving the patient, um, but we're but we're both you know staying um, true to our own expertise? So the first thing we talked about was the OT scope of practice, and you guys, I had no idea how wide the OT scope of practice is. I had no clue. Um, so she shared with me an official document of the AOTA, and it was published in the American Journal of um, Occupational Therapy in August of 2020. And it's titled, The OT Practice Framework, Domain and Process. So basically, domain would be like big categories that describe um, certain things that, that there is an established body of knowledge and expertise within um, the OT practice. And it lists a bunch of occupations. And one of those main categories is health management. And it says, it's basically describing management and maintenance of health and wellness routines. And if you kind of scroll down in, in the list, there's a section called physical activity. And it literally lists, that means cardiovascular exercise, strength training, balance training, to improve and maintain health and decrease risk of health episodes. Then, if you look further, they break it down into processes, right? So if the main categories are these domains and occupations, then they look at processes, which are basically clinical actions, um, services provided that are focused on participation in occupations. And you guys, they have categories literally that spell out pushing, pulling, lifting, transporting objects. I mean, these are all our main functional movement skills. And, and, and this document is extensive, but what I want you to take away from just me reading a few of those categories off is that exercise and functional movement is in the wheelhouse of OT. So much in their wheelhouse, which is amazing because that means that we can both work together to get our patients to turn into these robust human beings, right? And so, you know, when we talk about, when me and Matt are talking about this, it's, I don't think a lot of PTs realize that. And, and that could be where we start to have this, you know, turf war of why is, why is OT working on functional movement, right? And then from the OT side, Maddie was saying that a lot of OTs, you know, they just, they forget or they don't realize that these biomechanical factors, these functional movements are also within their scope of practice. So if we think about these silos that we absolutely need to break and, and where it comes from that we're so territorial, and a lot of you guys have probably experienced this, um, you know, we, a PT sees an OT walking with the patient down the hallway and they, they're like, why is the OT walking my patient, right? Or, um, you know, conversely, PT is working on uh, dressing or ADLs and OT is like, why are, they, why are they working on that? They shouldn't be doing that. And it, from Maddie's point of view, um, you know, she was saying that from the beginning of time, OT has always like focused on function. Function occupation has been the mainstay, the foundation of their scope of practice. And it wasn't always like that for PT. Um, you know, there were days that, you know, we could just click gait training, Therex, reps and sets, and, and we didn't have to tie it to any sort of function whatsoever. And, and now we do. And so there is some of that blurred lines there, but in a way, like I think of it, like that's not a bad thing, right? Like both of us working towards a functional goal should be seen as a win because many of our patients, like their goal is something meaningful to them. 
and many of our patients, you know, that is something that is functional. And we really have to ask ourselves, am I getting upset because PT or OT is doing X intervention? Is that because there's some harm that's going to be done to the patient? Or is that because our own ego is hurting? And if it's the latter, then you really have to reconsider because the patient is going to be the one that suffers, right? If we are putting that those territorial um, thoughts and and the turf war, if we're putting that above what is most important to our patient, because we are in healthcare and we are here to serve humans, we are not here to serve our own egos. So we have to self-reflect and look at ourselves first. And, you know, it's just, it's, we have to, to really consider if the goal is something that both PT and OT can work on together, but also separately, right? Because we know that with insurance, we have to still be separate. And I don't want to get into the weeds necessarily of like for Medicare reimbursement, talking about how we have to document goals differently and document interventions differently so that we're not duplicating services. Like that's still important, but we still need to find a way to work together towards that ultimate functional goal. So when we think about why else we need to break these silos, a lot of patients are only gonna get one discipline, right? They're only, and a lot of times, unfortunately, they're only gonna get PT. And, and you know, Maddie mentioned like that just, that just sucks, right? That we kind of get pushed out a lot. And if you kind of think about this in the hospital, the patient's going home, they're about to discharge, only they're gonna only have time for one discipline to come in there we have to kind of share knowledge and share skill. They're only gonna get one of us for a short amount of time. And so when I asked Maddie, like from an OT's perspective, a patient's here, they're about to leave. They have OT deficits, but they're not gonna get OT. How do we, how do we speak to the patient? Like how do we speak to the OT to, to be respectful and share skills and knowledge? And Maddie mentioned that instead of saying like, hey, what, what things can I work on today? Give me some things to work on. Instead of that, really making it known that we value their skill set. Like, my patient's about to leave. They have a lot of OT deficits. I really value what you could bring to this patient. Are there certain exercises, certain activities or resources, anything you could teach me that you feel comfortable passing along to my patient today? A lot of it is language, Maddie mentioned, that we need to be incredibly respectful of the other discipline and, and, and not to use language that makes, it, that makes it sound like we can just kind of take over what their goal is or take over what um, their interventions would be. So Maddie and I started talking about criticisms are of our own profession when it comes to this. So for PT, and a lot, of, a lot of you all who are listening here in the ICE community know that we preach about um, underdosing in the PT world and, and doing exercise that, that doesn't have any tie to function. And in the OT world, Maddie mentioned that her criticism is that a lot of the time, OT may be so focused on function, so focused on just getting that patient as independent as possible with a certain task, um, that they forget what the root of the problem is, right? So that could look like, okay, they, they don't have the eccentric lowering control to get down to the toilet, a regular toilet, so let's just get them an elevated toilet seat, or let's get them a bedside commode or let's get them a reacher. And that maybe some OTs can be so focused on that versus what is the root of the problem? Is it mobility? Is it strength? And maybe they should be focusing there 
versus just compensatory mechanisms. And not that compensatory mechanisms are important and they're very crucial, but we need to think beyond that is what Maddie is saying. So from there, what could we think about in terms of like the intricacies of a patient treatment session, right? So what are some pain points that come up between PT and OT and, and, and how can we work with that? So this is a scenario that I am so guilty of and it really brought to light when Maddie described this. And, and she said that a lot of times PT will come to OT and say, hey, OT, I worked on dressing with the patient today. I was an OT today. You don't need to work on it. I did it. And that really makes Maddie's blood boil because really, what could, does that typically look like? If PT is helping with dressing, a lot of the time it's maybe you let them attempt for a very short amount of time and then you just do it for them, right? You just put the shirt on for them. And for Maddie, she's like, I would literally spend that entire session just working on dressing. It wouldn't just be for 30 seconds and then, okay, I'm just gonna do it for you. So it's not valid and it's not really respectful if we were to just say, oh yeah, I was an OT for the day, worked on dressing. And, and it goes vice versa for PT too. If OT came in and said, hey, I walked the patient, you know, down the hallway, they're good to go home. It's, you know, don't worry about it. You don't need to do gait training. And as a PT, you're thinking, okay, but did you take into consideration that literally in order to get inside the home, we have stairs, we have gravel, they have to multitask. Um, you know, just walking a patient down an empty hallway does not mean they're safe to go home. So it goes both ways. So what would it look like, what would look better if a PT were to be working on something like ADLs and dressing with a patient? That an OT would look at that and say, wow, like, thank you for doing that. And what that scenario looks like, and this is something that I do with my patients a lot, is you know my patient sits up on the edge of the bed. Their shoes are sitting down on the floor, right? Most PTs, and I did this when I was a student, I, start, I just started to put the shoes on for the patient right away. And I was co-evaluating with an OT, and she literally, she didn't smack my hand, but she kind of put her hand up like, no, like let them try it themselves. And that really stuck with me. So I, you know, the patient sits up on the side of the bed and, and the first thing I ask is, hey, is it important to you that you're able to put your own shoes on? You need to ask that question first because if it's not important to them, then you don't need to work on it, right? Asking them if it's meaningful and important to them. If that answer is yes, then by God, let your patients try and put their own socks and shoes on PTs. That can be very powerful for the patient because that could be maybe the one task they're able to complete in that session and that's it. And that can give them a lot of accomplishment. And it gives us a lot of information. We get to see their hip mobility. We get to see if they get dizzy when they bend down to the ground. We get an idea of their trunk control and their balance. It gives us a ton of helpful, helpful information. So instead of just throwing the shoes on, actually let them attempt. And then you would be communicating that with the OT, like, hey, we attempted putting shoes on for X amount of seconds, X amount of minutes. This is what happened. This is what we found. This is what the patient had difficulty with. I want to give you this information in case that's important for when you go into your session with them. That is a very successful way where PT can be working on some sort of ADL, but 
be collaborating and communicating with the OT. And then the OT session can even be more beneficial from then with that information. And many times they're going to, thank you. Thank you for actually working on that with my patient. It's not saying I did this, you don't have to do it. I did it as well as you could do it, but you took that into consideration because it was important to the patient. So how else could a session look? Okay, so let's say we're starting with a goal that the patient has of being able to put their pants on by themselves in standing. All right, so when I think about that, I'm thinking about the functional movements. You need to hinge, deadlift, you need single leg stance, you need endurance. So maybe I would be working on deadlifting a kettlebell with that patient, getting them under some load, right? I would be working on single leg strength, single leg stability, endurance. And then maybe I would put that into a workout that included deadlift, some single leg stance, some balance, maybe some perturbation training, and, put, and attempting to put their pants on, on and off, and putting that into a workout. That's how I would structure my session. And then the patient is seeing and they're understanding the connection between the deadlift and putting their pants on, right? So then later, OT comes in for their session, and Maddie said a great way to incorporate what PT did is that I will ask the patient, show me what you did with PT. So they're going to, Maddie's gonna be able to assess skill retention, right? Skill transferability. We're looking at that motor learning. They're having a, to do a return demonstration. So they're gonna go ahead and do a deadlift and then Maddie is going to task practice, putting those pants on and off over and over and over again. And again, that patient is seeing the connection between the deadlift with, with what they did with PT and then what they're working on with OT. And Maddie would look at, hey, are they having some issues with, with the buttons and the coordination? And then she'd hammer in on those very specific skills. So I'm hoping that that, got, that gives you guys an idea of, of better ways to work with each other and, and to kind of open up your eyes a little bit to the scope of OT practice and, and how we can collaborate to, to reach the same goal. And it really ends with this bigger picture of realizing that, that and, and Dustin Jones speaks to this a lot, that like people are fundamentally different. Right, it, it, like a human is going to be fundamentally different than I am and a PT is going to be fundamentally different than an OT. And we are going to have our own perspectives and our own opinions and that is not right or wrong. It's just your opinion or your perspective. And you need to stay very curious about the other person. Hey, when you were with this patient, I noticed you made this recommendation and, and when I was with the patient, you know, that wasn't my experience. Their performance was X, Y, Z. Can, can we kind of talk through more of what you saw and, and try and come, you know, to an agreement and get on the same page of what we think is the best plan for this patient? Like that is so much more collaborative if you just stay curious about what that other person's thought process is and seek to understand why they made the recommendation, why they're working on particular exercises versus thinking in silos and thinking right or wrong or my scope is more important than your scope, right? Because at the end of the day, we are here to serve humans and not our own egos. All right, that's long enough. Um, that's it. I would really love if PT, OT like joined this discussion. I want to learn more about how to collaborate better with OT. And, and so I really hope that um, you guys have some questions, some comments. If you want Maddie's information, I'd be happy to give it to you. I totally did not ask her if that was okay. She'll totally be fine with it, but she's an amazing resource. Um, and with that, have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday.
Hey, thanks for tuning in to the PT on Ice Daily Show. If you enjoyed this content, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. And be sure to check us out on Facebook and Instagram at the Institute of Clinical Excellence. If you're interested in getting plugged into more ICE content on a weekly basis while earning CEUs from home, check out our virtual ICE online mentorship program at ptonice.com. While you're there, sign up for our Hump Day Hustling newsletter for a free email every Wednesday morning with our top five research articles and social media posts that we think are worth reading. Head over to ptonice.com and scroll to the bottom of the page to sign up.